Well, tonight we're going to explore this controversial topic called the rapture. And I'm fond of calling it some, on certain occasions as the most preposterous belief in biblical Christianity. Most of us probably in this audience uh, uh, are familiar with the rapture and hold to that view, and yet we need to recognize, I think, at least acknowledge in our own minds, that it's a wild idea, strange idea, that in some, at some indeterminate moment, Christ's believers will be caught up, snatched up, out of this world, while the world goes on with a very, very definite agenda. And a uh, very strange idea. And uh, we're going to do this in two sessions. The first session, we're going to explore what's called the Blessed Hope. And the second session, we'll get into some of the background, and I'm going to call that pattern is prologue. If we understand the patterns that God deals with, it's very, very helpful. We'll look at strategic structure in the scriptures. But the word rapture, some people say it's not in your Bible. Well, actually it is, but we'll come to that. The Greek term, where it appears, is called the harpazo. And the harpazo, it's, uh, it, we're going to deal with it in the first session. We're going to talk about God's promise, the process, and the purpose. And then we'll talk in the second session, the prophetic profile, where it fits in, the problems that are associated with it, and then finally a proposal. So the first session will be the first three, the blessed hope, and the second session will be the final three, the prophetic profile, the problems, and the proposal. So let's take a look at it. Let's start with the promise. And if you have a Bible, I'm going to encourage you to turn to John 14. And as we do so, let's remember the context. This is that last night. They would go from there to Gethsemane and, the, and the, all the episodes through the night and the following day and the climax in the, cruci in the crucifixion. Jesus has just finished dipping the sop and announcing that he was be going to be betrayed. Judas, thus identified, has left. And something worth understanding is that the timing was controlled by Jesus Christ. The one thing that they did not want to do is take him on a feast day, certainly not on Passover. If you study there, Matthew 26 and so forth, the background. But Jesus let the cat out of the bag himself. And he announced to Judas that Judas is going to betray him, which forced Judas to fish or cut bait. If he's going to do it, he had to do it that night. So he takes off to make the arrangements. But what's left in the room then are the, the 11, the believing disciples. Judas is gone. And Jesus makes, announces a fascinating promise. The first verse in the chapter says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. Just four days ago, Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem and was proclaimed the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King, on the exact day that Daniel had previously predicted, or I should say that Gabriel told Daniel, five centuries ago. But he's announcing to disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. That's a, a, let's just recognize how audacious that statement is. Angels were not to be worshipped, but he's putting himself quite apart from that. There are four possibilities. He either was God or wasn't, either knew or didn't know accordingly. Now, if he, was God, if he wasn't God and didn't know it, we'd have him condemned as a lunatic. We're indebted to C.S. Lewis for this simplification, but it certainly makes sense. If he, if he wasn't God and knew that he wasn't, then he's a liar. He should be stoned. Obviously, if he was God, he knew. But if he was God and knew that he was God, we call him Lord. And that's what this is all about. He's going to, because that's all true, he's going to announce his program. In the next verse, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be, also. Fabulous, fabulous commitment. Jesus also will make mention before the evening's over that it's essential that he leaves so that the Holy Spirit can come, so that the Comforter can come. For some reason undisclosed, they seem to be mutually exclusive. Jesus would have to leave before the Comforter could be given. And it's going to be interesting that we'll see that reversal occur before he returns. The Comforter, in the sense that he indwells, will be withdrawn and he will come. But the main thing to notice here, we see Father's house of many mansions. You know, we tend to, to uh, visualize heaven probably as a street with buildings because we think of cities. But um, the, the idiom here, at least, is that we actually 
will have a, a specially tailored environment within heaven, within, within, within the Father's house. And he goes there to prepare a place. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also, and from that time on will always be with him. Now, I want you to notice the frequency of you in these verses. For not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Who's the focus here? You are. And uh, the disciples, of course, and by extension ourselves. There's a background piece that you and I are um, uh, absent of, and that is a Jewish wedding, especially the ancient Jewish wedding. You and I are familiar with a wedding uh, uh, approach or formula or ritual that's quite distant from the, the ancient Jewish wedding after which the Bible is patterned. It opens with a ketubah, the betrothal, the commitment. The, generally on the part of the, uh, the uh, prospective bridegroom, he took the initiative and they established a marriage covenant. And uh, the negotiating price, the mohair, was, uh, uh, he had to pay to purchase for his, for his bride. And uh, once that was done, from that point on, she was set aside. She was, she was sanctified in a sense, set, aside, set apart. Uh, from that moment on, uh, 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 she was considered exclusively for the bridegroom. It was an enforceable contract. Remember Joseph and Mary, they were espoused, and yet he had that problem because it, even though it was just an espousal, he was committed. It was a, it was a, it, it, uh, it was a committed situation in, um, in Matthew 1 and also in Malachi 2 and so forth. So, um, and as a symbol of that relationship, they would both drink wine as a sealing that. So that, uh, that led to the next step, and, and this is all, you'll find this all through the scripture in Judges uh, 14, 10, and 11, all the way through. Uh, but let's go on to the next part. When after that happens, the bridegroom would depart to his father's house, and he would prepare typically a room addition that would, be, uh, would take some time for him to construct and arrange for. Meanwhile, sheep would prepare for his imminent return. This is a very interesting concept that we need to embrace and understand because it's re referred to all through the scripture. And that is that the bridegroom, they're committed, but they're not married yet. And the bridegroom is absent. And he, how long he'll be gone is deliberately indeterminate. She does not know when he's going to return. It, that's what we mean by eminence. There was no preconditioned event that would that would have to take place before he could return. And when he finally did return, there was a surprise gathering, usually at night, often at midnight. And he would, uh, he would uh, uh, sometimes be gone, say maybe for a year, while he, he added a room to his father's house. And that would you know, give her, of course, a chance to get her trousseau together and get prepared for married life. And uh, so he would, uh, at the end of this separation, he would come to take his bride with him. The groom, the best man, other male attendants would uh, leave the father's house, conduct a torchlight procession typically to the home of the bride. And although, although the bride was expecting her groom to come, she didn't know when. And so as a result, the groom's arrival was typically preceded by a shout, and which, was, uh, which forewarned the bride to be prepared for his coming. In the notes that will accompany this, uh, we'll have all the footnotes and the authorities for all these things. But that then leads to the... the, uh, the uh, Hoopa. I might mention, by the way, in the surprise gathering, that is even memorialized in Matthew 25 by Jesus when he talks about the ten famous ten versions. Understand that parable, the context of it. They're waiting for the surprise of the bridegroom coming. You find that all through the scriptures, if you know where to look, Psalm 45 and so on. But anyway, the hoopa then that leads to the, the wedding proper, and uh, they would... Uh, they would be escorted by the members of the wedding party to the bridal chamber, originally a hoopah, now just memorialized with a little canopy, but in the original days it was a separate chamber. And prior to, prior to entering the chamber, the bride remained veiled so that no one could see her face. And while the groomsmen and the bridesmaid waited outside, the bride and groom entered the bridal chamber alone. There in the privacy of that place, they entered into the physical union for the first time that consummated the marriage and uh, that uh, was covenant pr presumably maybe a, a year earlier. And after it was consummated, the groom would come out of the bridal chamber, announce that the consummation of the marriage to the members of the wedding party, and uh, uh, then the guests and so forth. The, the wedding party would announce it to the guests and so forth. And that leads, of course, to the marriage supper. It lasted typically seven days. 
You'll find that in a number of places. Uh, Judges 14, Matthew 9. Uh, Matthew 22, again, we have it used as an idiom in, in the parables and so forth. So um, they had a great wedding feast. So, um, and, uh, and, a, and after the uh, seven days, the bride would be unveiled and everyone could see her face and so forth. So that's it. Now, what's interesting, this marriage model is not only in the scriptures and in other authorities, it's fulfilled in the idiom of the church in the scripture. The covenant was established, 1 Corinthians 11.25 deals with that. The purchase price was nothing other than the blood of Christ himself, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 is, goes through that. In fact, that's what we usually do when we take communion, is to commemorate that. The bride then was set apart. You want to really read carefully Ephesians 5, 25-27, where we have instructions, where Paul tells the, you know, the wives to submit to your husbands and so forth, and he goes through that whole thing, and then even quotes Genesis 2.24, for this cause, a man leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife, the two shall be one flesh. He quotes that in the context of the bride of, 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 the bride of Christ and Christ himself, he, Christ in the church. The very next verse after he quotes that, he says, but I, just about the time you get there, you think he's, what Paul is talking about is the marriage relationship. But then he throws you a curveball. He says, I speak of Christ in the church. He's expressing this model. And we're reminded of the first covenant in 1 Corinthians 11. The bridegroom presently has left for the Father's house. That's where he's been for this interval period of time. And there will be an escort to accompany him upon his return to gather his bride. And we'll see that in 1 Thessalonians 4 shortly. So that leads us then to the process. We understand that he's going to gather his bride. How is he going to do that? You know, it's interesting to me to realize that without any scripture, you know the rapture has to take place. Because there is a point at which all the believers are going to receive resurrection bodies and be with the Lord. Well, whenever that happens, there's going to be some believers that haven't died yet. So they are going to be changed along with the bodies being resurrected. So that's all we mean by the rapture. Well, this could be described here in 1 Thessalonians 4. It's, it, but let's, before we get into you know, this whole idea of the resurrection body isn't just a New Testament idea. It's all through the Bible. In fact, the oldest book of the Bible, Job 19, quotes, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at that latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. An incredible declaration of his conviction of the res resurrection of the body. But uh, in the Thessalonian church, Paul was there for about three weeks, founded this church, and uh, shortly after he left, he found out that they were, get, they were getting very upset because some of their friends had died. A grandma here, a mother there, whatever, and some of their, in the believing community, some of them had died, and they were disturbed because they felt, apparently, that, they were, that, that, that those that had died had somehow left, been left out of something. It's interesting that they had that much consciousness of the, the eminent return. But then Paul writes him a letter in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, which is an euphemism for those that passed on, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So he's talking about the believing dead here, right? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also, which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. Okay, so when he, when he comes back, he's going to have them with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. Really? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So this is the place where the word rapture occurs. The word caught up in the Greek is harpazo. And it's interesting to know, we don't, often the quotes end up at verse 17. I think verse 18 is part of this passage. It says, wherefore we comfort one another with these words. There are people that believe that the rapture will occur after the uh, Great Tribulation. 
And that puts the Lord in this, this kind of, this puts the bridegroom in this kind of a program. Come, we're going to get married. Then I'm going to beat the living daylights out of you. And then we'll go have dinner. <laughs> Comfort your another with these words. You say, the word rapture does not appear in your Bible. It does if you're reading the Latin Bible. In the Vulgate, this is the, this is the Latin Vulgate. The word is rapimir, which is it's the proper tense of rapio, which is it, uh, our English words rapt and rapture come from the past participle of rapio. So it's derived from that verb. So the word rapture occurs, in effect, in its proper tense in Latin, in the Latin Bible, in the Vulgate. That's where we get this term. People who say it's rapture is not the Bible, they haven't done their homework. There are actually, surprisingly enough, seven raptures in the Scripture. Enoch, you could call, was raptured back in Genesis 5, so designated in Hebrews 11. Elijah was taken in 2 Kings 2. Jesus, of course, is the classic example. And uh, Philip in Acts 8, verse 39. Paul, when he's taken to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12. These are all familiar passages. And the body of Christ is spoken here in 1 Thessalonians 4. And there's one more when John is called up in the first verse of Revelation chapter 4. In fact, what's interesting is for these, the actual word harpazo is used. And probably the most provocative one of all of these, to me, is Revelation 12.5. And uh, in Revelation 12, we have Israel portrayed as the woman. The woman that really, in a sense, starts with Eve. It's the woman that gave birth to the man-child, the Messiah. She brought forth a man-child. But some people try to make that the church in Revelation 12. That's, again, a, a strange contrivance because clearly it's identified by its idioms there, drawn from Genesis. Jacob in Genesis actually identifies her, her for you. But furthermore, she's the one that brought forth the man-child. She's the mother. She's not the wife or the bride. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Who would that be? Jesus Christ. Psalm 110, several places. Okay. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. When I, whenever I read that as a kid, I always presumed what that's referring to is the ascension. And it may well be. But I believe it was G.H. Pember who first recognized the possibility that what may be in view here is the catching up of the body of Christ, the church itself. In fact, the word there for caught up, interesting enough, is harpazo, the same word that we have in 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay, so that's the process. What's the purpose of all this? What's going on? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 deals with this for us. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So that's our problem. If we're saved, yes, but we're still in flesh. Flesh cannot inherit. The... So there's got to be a transition. For those that have died, it's at the resurrection. But uh, in verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, a mystery in the Greek, the, mystery, the word means something up till now has been hidden, I'm now revealing. They use the term mystery a little differently than we use it. It's more like revealing a password kind of thing. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Notice the we there, by the way. Paul identified himself in this category in some surprising ways, especially even in the second letter we'll come to. We shall not all sleep, we shall, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The climax then is, the next verse says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now, in 2 Corinthians 5, there's a passage that's often overlooked by people who are in this rapture issue that um, came up in our studies when we were investigating Genesis 6. And I'm indebted to Tommy Ice's recent uh, newsletter who highlights something else. So we've got something to trade here. Kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5, first verse says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. 
Now, it's in the Greek that this has some subtleties we want to be sensitive to. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, he's using here the idiom of a tent for our temporary dwellings. Why? Because a tent is typically considered a temporary dwelling for camping or whatever. You and I are in our temporary dwellings that, that serves us for a period of, what, three score and ten or whatever. We know that if our earthly house of this tent were dissolved, we have a building of God, a building of God. He's, he's shifting to a, a, a more permanent idiom here. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. But anyway, he goes on then. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now the word house here is an interesting word. In the Greek it's oketerian. And it's interesting because it only occurs twice in the Bible. Once here as referring to that which we aspire to in our resurrection bodies. The only other place it shows up is in Jude 6. And there, <laughs> it's a strange illusion. In Jude 6, he's talking about the bizarre goings-on of Genesis 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, hath he reserved an everlasting change under darkness into the unto the judgment of the great day. He's referring to the judgment of those angels that generated the Nephilim in Genesis 6. And what's interesting is this first estate, the word is arche, which is, uh, means principality or magistry of either angels or demons. They left that. They, could, they kept not their first estate, but they left their own habitation. The word habitation there again is oketerian, this dwelling that they disrobed themselves of to engage in this mischief in Genesis 6. It's the same word that describes that body that we aspire to in our resurrection bodies that will be instantly uh, given to us uh, at the rapture. In fact, see the next verse. It's interesting. Paul reveals something here in the third verse of 2 Corinthians 5. He says, um, picking up the, let me take verse 2 first. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. What on earth is he talking about? You see, when someone dies... Their body, of course, goes in the ground or whatever. What happens to their spirit? Anyone? They're with the Lord immediately in the spirit. They don't have their bodies yet. When do they get their bodies? At the resurrection. Paul talks, uses that phrase naked as being with the Lord, but not with his body until the resurrection. And what he is revealing here, interestingly enough, is his desire, his hope, that he could be raptured so that, he's, uh, that he will be uh, not naked for that interval, whatever that interval is. And the, uh, to be clothed upon, in, the, in verse 2, is uh, ependomai. It comes from epi, en, and duo. Uh, it means to put on over, put one piece of clothing over another presently being worn. So it's Paul's aspiration that he could be raptured because then he is, the whole thing takes place at once because what was in view here was the idea that he, the spirit would be with the Lord for some interval from the time he died until he until the resurrection takes place. We talked about the Jewish wedding, the ketubah, the betrothal, payment of the purchase price, the bride set apart, the bridegroom departs to his father's house, prepares the room addition, and the bride then prepares for his return, which is imminent, could happen any time. And this leads to a very fundamental teaching in the New Testament. We call the doctrine of eminence. And uh, what it simply means is that there's nothing that need precede it. Doesn't mean it'll happen tomorrow, but it could happen tomorrow or next week, or anything. It, there's no precedent requirement. If it's eminent, it means it could be right now. The word eminent, it's the next expectation. The next event in God's program is for the bride to be gathered by the bridegroom. There are all kinds of other things that will happen subsequently, but that's the next thing to happen. A, a next expectation. There's no precedent condition. Now, don't confuse this with eminent. It's spelled with an A, eminent. That... Uh, that's, that, re, that, that means that God is not only transcendent or far above us, but he's always with us and active on our behalf. So that term in theology has another meaning, a different spelling. Nor should it be confused with eminent, which is a title of honor reserved with persons of outstanding distinction. So there's three different words that get confused. Eminent with an I, I-M-M-I-N-A-T, meaning next expectation, nothing, nothing, nothing need precede it. Believers are taught to expect the Savior from heaven at any moment. That's all through the New Testament. 
Philippians 3.20, Titus 2.13, Hebrews 9.28, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, 5, Revelation 22, and so on. Clearly, you cannot get through the New Testament without a consciousness that the believers were to conduct their lives in a moment-by-moment -moment expectancy of the return of the Savior. That whole concept is eminency. If you understand that, that, that concept, you'll discover many theories that are floating around the landscape would violate that. If there are precedent conditions, then, uh, uh, then that, that punctures the doctrine of eminency. And the, the First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.10 is the best example. It expresses the hope and warmth of, of expectancy. And it should result in a victorious and purified life. People who are living with that expectancy are minding their knitting. They're, 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 uh, they're, they're living their lives in a literal expectation that the Lord could come at any moment. The minute you start letting go of that is when you, you'll find you start slipping. It's a very, very purifying doctrine. Now, by the way, Paul did seem to include himself among those who look for Christ's return. We saw that in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2, also the uh, 2 Thessalonians 5 we just looked at. Timothy was admonished by Paul to keep his, this commandment without spot or rebuke until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the Jewish converts are reminded that yet a little while and he that shall come will come and he will not tarry, Hebrews 10. You, there are many of these. In fact, the Lord's instruction on the other side is to occupy till I come. And uh, see, the expectation of some were so strong that they'd stop work. They got, you know, Lord's, the Lord's coming next Tuesday, let's relax. And uh, so they had to be exhorted to return to their jobs in 2 Thessalonians 3 and have patience, James 5.8. In other words, there was such an expectation, they were sort of overreacting to that and uh, putting their feet on the desk, you know. And that's tragic because that's also a legitimate criticism of people who embrace the doctrine I'm talking about, the, the pre-trib rapture. Some of the people who don't hold that view can be critical of us because they, that uh, there's a tendency of, of us not to roll up our sleeves and recognize there's things that need to be done in the meantime. So there's two extreme problems. One problem is the rap what I call rapturitis, rapture paralysis, you might call it. And the other one is the rapture mania, the date setters. And uh, both, those are both extremes at the opposite ends. Rapturitis. That's a uniquely American dementia, I believe. When I travel abroad, I don't f find as much as here. But here in America, it's amazing how many people who believe in the rapture, pre-trib rapture, just because the church, I think you can show from the scripture, and we'll get into that in the next session, will not go through the Great Tribulation. Why should we escape what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the past 2,000 years has had to endure? It's called persecution. Church was promised persecution. And, uh, and you can call that persecution tribulation. It's trouble times. It's not the great tribulation as definitively, definitively described. It's tribulation that comes from where? Where does the church get persecuted? From the world and from Satan. The great tribulation has its source as the wrath of God. That's a different thing altogether. We are promised not to experience the wrath of God. We may experience all kinds of correction. We may endure all kinds of persecution. Indeed, that's not the Great Tribulation. We'll come to that. And there's an attitude that somehow, especially here in America, that Christians are not going to have any problems. We could be facing very dark times. Where do we get the audacity, the arrogance, to assume that we're going to escape what most of the body of Christ and most of the world for most of the last 1900 years had to endure? It's called persecution. And... Uh, now, the other side of the coin is the date setters. Boy, there's a long history of these. I won't take you through them all. But you can go through almost every segment of history. We've had, uh, was Jacobo Flores in the, in the 13th century, a uh, bunch of them all the way through, uh, even to uh, recent times, William Miller in 1843, and then again on October in, in 1844, and then uh, C.T. Russell in 1874. Most of us remember E.C. Uh, e. Wisenant's books, 88 Reasons for 1988. Those books are a collector's item, huh? Uh, Harold Camping in September of 1994, he had that nailed. And of course with the 2000, now we're in a new thousand, you know, a whole new cycle. There's a whole new cycle of people with charts and diagrams explaining jubilee years, whatever. And, and uh, let's take a quick look at the scripture. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. In fact, the Mark reference of that same thing says, not the Son, but the Father only. Interesting passage. Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. 
Matthew 24, 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. There again, it's not date saved, but notice again the eminence that's there. Be ready. Because you don't know when he's going to, he can arrive at any moment. So don't set dates. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. I believe the reason this thing is not clear is because God is going to catch Satan by surprise. That's part of the strategy, I believe. Personal conjecture. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Luke 12, 40. Acts 1, 7. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, the thing you discover as you get into this topic in depth, you start collecting the verses that seem to refer to what I'll call the second coming of Jesus Christ. For every, most of you realize that there's, when in his first coming there were over 300 prophecies that were specifically fulfilled in his first coming. What you may not realize is that for every one of those, there are eight prophecies of a second coming. There's over 2,500 specific details of a second coming. So as you go through your Bible study, you start collecting those, and as you start collecting those and examining them, you'll discover, you'll discover something rather strange. You'll discover that there's a cluster of them that have a lot in common. And I'm going to call those, for lack of a better term, the second coming. His return in power to set up his kingdom. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 12, Zechariah, all through the New Testament, on it goes, Revelation, so on. And there's a whole list. I won't go through each one of these individually. They'll be in your notes for those who want to track them down. We're going to compare them another way. But there's, there's one group that have a certain set of characteristics in common, and a couple of dozen of those. There's another group that I'll call the rapture passages that are quite different. In fact, you discover they're contradictory. In one case, you don't know when he's coming. In the other one, you're going to know exactly when he's coming. In one case, he comes in secret for his own. In the other one, every eye shall see him. You begin to realize, wait a minute. As you study these two clusters of a couple of dozen references in each bucket, you begin to realize this has to be talking about two different things. And indeed it does. The second coming of Christ in the broad sense is it comes in two phases. Once for the church, once for Israel. Once for the church to fulfill his promises to his bride. And secondly, he comes in power to fulfill all the commitments that God has laid down in both the Old and New Testaments for a kingdom on the earth where he'll take David's throne, etc., and uh, very, very interesting times. Two events. Let's contrast these a different way, by function rather than by reference. In one case, the rapture, there's a translation of all the believers. In the second coming, there's no translation involved. He comes into the earth and sets up his kingdom on the earth, and there's people that live in the earth. They have children. They have, you go in the millennium, there's going to be people that die. It's a different kind of, you know. It's different in some respects, and yet it's not, it's not eternity yet. That comes at the end of the thousand years. In the rapture, the translated saints go to heaven. In the second coming, translated saints return to the earth with him. Different deal. It's, a different, it's in a different lane of traffic, if I may. In the rapture, the earth isn't judged. He doesn't come to the earth. He gathers, meets us in the air. The judgment comes later, the second coming. The earth's judged. Here's perhaps the most important distinction between these two groups of prophecies. In the one case, they're imminent at any moment, and they're signless. There's no sign that needs to precede the rapture, other than the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and that's like now. There isn't a precedent set of conditions you can see coming. For the second coming, there is the most documented period of time in the entire Bible, a seven-year history that has more information about it than any other period of time in the Bible. It precedes the second coming. If that starts, you can set, almost set the date. In fact, there's a mid-course correction. Make sure you're on track. When they say the rapture is not in the Old Testament. I don't happen to believe that. I'll show you why. But that's the standard dictum. And, of course, second coming is all predicted throughout the Old Testament. Rapture is the believers only. Second coming affects all men on earth. The rapture occurs before the day of wrath is so promised. And the second coming concludes the day of wrath. So the rapture has no reference to Satan. He's not a player. In fact, his whole thing, I think, is geared to get him by surprise. Second coming, Satan's bound. When the rapture occurs, that's like a starting gun for Satan because he knows he's got a little bit of, only a little time. That's part of the game that's going on. The rapture, Jesus comes for his own. Second coming, he comes with his own. That's what the references say in many places. Rapture comes in the air, the, the second coming comes to the earth. 
Rapture, he claims his bride. Second coming, he comes with his bride. In the rapture, only his own will see him. You know, it's interesting. After his resurrection, he was only seen by loving eyes and he was only touched by loving hands. You study the Chronicle very carefully. It's very interesting. Apparently, in the rapture, too, only his own will see him. Second coming, every eye will see him and tremble. Rapture, generally, the great tribulation begins. Now, I'm going to be cautious about this. That's the way it's usually presented. Not necessarily at that instant, but the rapture triggers a series of events that, caught, that leads to the great tribulation. The second coming, the millennium begins. The rapture is the church believers only. Many scholars point out that the Old Testament saints will not be resurrected until after the millennium. That comes as a shock to many, but you can check Daniel 12 to check that out for yourself. So we see the marriage fulfilled, the covenant's been established, 1 Corinthians 11, the purchase price has been paid, 1 Corinthians 6, Brides have been set apart in all kinds of references. That's most of the New Testament is it admonitions to the bride to keep herself apart, preserved. We're reminded of the covenant again in 1 Corinthians 11. The bridegroom left for the father's house, and we're waiting for 1 Thessalonians 4. So in the next session, we'll take a break, but the next session I'm going to say pattern is prologue. We're going to take a look at strategic structure in the scripture, and uh, partly for a strategic perspective and partly for some surprises that uh, um, you may find rather provocative. So uh, let's take a brief period. But as we do, as we do, I want you to be thinking about the invitation that Jesus has given to the bride. I go to prepare a place for you. Is he preparing a place for you? Is Jesus busy right now, tonight, preparing a place for you? Are you certain of that? Because that's really what it's all about. And we'll talk more about that in the next session. Let's take a break. Well, in our first session, which I call the Blessed Hope, we've been through the promise, the process, and the purpose of the harpazo, or rapture. Now we'll go into the second session, which we're talking about patterns. We're talking about the prophetic profile that this all fits into, some problems that come up, uh, a result of the subject, and then a final uh, proposal. So let's take a look at the prophetic profile. You know, it's interesting that Jesus gave a confidential briefing on his second coming to his disciples. Actually, a very private briefing. Only four guys were there. Four disciples, Peter, James, and John, the inner three, plus Peter's brother Andrew. These four. And uh, Jesus gave them a, a briefing that's recorded in three of the four Gospels. And it's recorded, of course, in Matthew 24 and 25, which is usually regarded as the definitive one. Man Matthew took shorthand, so we have confidence that he probably had it almost verbatim. He had to have shorthand skills to be, to, for his job as a customs official. That's, a, that's, that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, it's also recorded in Mark 13, which is Peter's gospel, where Mark was his secretary, and, then, and in Luke, Luke 21, who reconstructed it from, from comments later. So... Now, interestingly enough, the main point, I'm not going to go through those whole briefings, that's a study in itself, but the main point of those three rec records is that Jesus highlights a number of things that are non-signs. This, that, and the other thing will happen, but the end is not yet. But then he highlights the, what turns out to be the key to end-time prophecy. He points them to Daniel 9. There's a very famous passage the last four verses of Daniel 9 are the key to understanding prophecy. If you take the trouble to really understand those four verses, then everything else will fall into place. It's a, it becomes a litmus test of many ideas if you really understand those four verses. Many books I've read that are confused are also confused about Daniel 9. They don't mention it or they have some strange theories about it. It's pretty clear. You want to do a careful study. of If you really want to start your serious study of prophecy, you want to master the last four verses of Daniel 9. The so-called 70 weeks. Daniel was in prayer. He knew from his reading of the scriptures, namely Jeremiah, that the 70-year captivity was about up. So he knew that they were about to be released to go back home and rebuild the temple and so forth. And so as a result of knowing that, he goes to prayer. You know what a lesson that is. That's what Jesus tells us to do. When he says, when you pray, thy kingdom come. That's part of the Lord's prayer. What are you praying for? For his kingdom to come, to be set up on the earth. It's astonishing that most churches don't believe that. 
Most churches somehow have a... We'll come back to that in a little later. But anyway, so Daniel is in intense prayer. And in the first 19 verses of D Daniel 9, as he prays for his people and himself and so forth, you can feel him tremble, even in the English translation. If you watch the frequency of the verbs get tighter and tighter, you can, you, you can almost see him tremble to the point where he's interrupted in that prayer by Gabriel, who then gives him a, this classic four verses. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, there's a verse that gives you the scope of the whole thing. The next verse lays out in detail 69 weeks of years precisely. In fact, the precision of verse 25 of Daniel 9 is so astonishing. It's probably the thing that some 50 years ago galvanized me as a Christian. I'd already accepted the Lord, as many people have in their teens, whatever. But when I uh, encountered, through some, surprise, some special tutoring, uh, discovered what uh, Sir Robert Anderson's unraveling of the 70 Weeks of Daniel, his classic work in 1890, uh, in his classic work in 1894, is uh, worth should be on everyone's library. The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. But in any case, uh, verse 25 are 69 weeks. Then there's a very key verse to understand. That's verse 26 because it talks about some things that happen after the 69 weeks of years, but before the 70th, meaning they're not contiguous. Many people who get you know get this muddled up don't recognize that all 70 are not contiguous. The first 69 are, then there's an interval with some specific things that happen in that interval, and then there's a final one. And that architecture of the four verses, it, once you understand that, it all starts to come together very clearly. The um, 69 weeks of years, the, the angel Gabriel tells uh, Daniel that from the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah the King, it would be 69 weeks of years. To make a long story short, that's 173,880 days. Well, we know the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. That was, the, that was under Nehemiah, the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus on March 14th to 445 B.C. There are actually four decrees, but the other three had to do with the temple. If you study the book of Ezra, you know they tried to build their temple. They had nothing but problems until Nehemiah got the authority for them to rebuild the city. And that's what the, that's specifically expressed in, the, in, uh, in verse 25. The big mystery is, okay, when did Jesus allow himself to be presented as a king? It turns out, if you study that carefully, there's only one day he allowed it to happen. Many times they tried, and he said, my hour is not yet to come. Then one day, he dispatches his disciples to a particular place to give them a code word, release a donkey. He takes that donkey, and he rides it from Bethany up over the, road, uh, the, the Mount of Olives, down through the, the, uh, what's called the Golden Gate, into Jerusalem, deliberately fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. That the king would come presenting himself as a donkey. And that occurred on April 6, 32 AD, and these dates can be nailed down. The net of it is, it turns out that between those two dates is 173,880 days. Gabriel's margin for error was zero. He predicted the exact day that Jesus would present, that the Messiah would present himself as a king to Jerusalem. And what's astonishing about that, it's during that interval between those two dates that the entire Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, was translated into Greek. It's called the Septuagint version, and that was done three centuries before. Three centuries earlier, this prophecy was part of the Old Testament and therefore translated into Greek. So verse 25 of Daniel 9, in and of itself, when you understand the background and the rest of it, is one of the most astonishing demonstrations of the deity of Christ, that he really was who he said he was. Now, the next verse is that we want to focus on a little bit here is the interval. That's verse 26 between the two. After three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be karat, executed for a capital crime, but not for himself. Who for? You and me. You got it, kid. Right on. But not for himself. And the people of the princes shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And in the end of the war, desolations are determined. Well, we all know that... Uh, when Jesus rode that donkey, he predicted that the city would be destroyed. And 38 years later it was, under Titus Vespasian, when the Roman legions laid siege to the city and for nine months slaughtered a million men, women, and children and laid level Jerusalem. So the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the sanctuary. Who are the people of the prince that shall come? The Romans. Therefore, the prince that shall come, which is one of the titles of this final world ruler, we know he comes from the Roman Empire. That does not mean he comes from Western Europe. That's where many of us stumble, me included. 
It's in my early thing. I didn't realize. It's up to think because all of us forget that the eastern leg of the Roman Empire outlasted the western leg by a thousand years. Constantine moved the capital of the world to Byzantium from Rome, called it Constantinople. Here's a diagram. The first, verse 25 was 69 weeks, 7 plus 62. Verse 26 was the interval that we've talked about. And in that interval, four days later, comes if, after, after, the, after the donkey ride, Jesus gets crucified, but not for himself. And then we have the temple destroyed. Those events took about 38 years, but we know this interval has had to at least, it had to last at least 38 years. We've discovered by experience it's lasted the better part of 2,000 years. But there is verse 27 of Daniel 9. It's the 70th week. 69 weeks were fulfilled with a precision that's astonishing. The 70th week has more details described about it in both the Old and the New Testament than any other period of time in human history. That's what we call the strange period, the 70th week of Daniel. Since it's a week of years, many people call it the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And that's comfortable as an idiom of literature, but it's actually technically incorrect. Seven years for the week, yes, but the great tribulation is the last half of that week. So let's take a look at the 70th week. It's, it's critical for us. It's defined in Daniel 9.27 as a covenant that's enforced by a world leader, this final super guy. I like to call him Nimrod II. The first world dictator was Nimrod, and I believe he's going to come out of that same region, and he may make Babylon his capital. That's very different than many of the prophecy books. That doesn't mean I'm right, but at least it'll cause you to do a little digging on your own to check it out yourself. But the main point is that this week is defined by a covenant that he enforces, which means he has to emerge in public scenery before he's powerful enough to enforce a covenant that defines that week. So he's ahead of, he, he, one of the, he has to occur before this week does. Now in the middle of that seven year period, he violates that covenant by an event that has a technical term called the abomination of desolation. And Jesus points to that event as the key to end time prophecy. And that's going to happen in the middle of this seven-year period. The reason it's so important is it initiates. See, there, these, the, the 70th week is divided into two halves. Each half is described as three and a half years, is described as 42 months, is described as 1260 days. Each half has those references in the Old Testament and the New. Again and again, all criss, criss, cross-referenced. So we know the, the precision here by the Holy Spirit is clearly beyond any attempt to make it symbolic or just a figure of speech, that sort of thing. Now, the reason it's also so important, Jesus himself labels the last half of that seven-year period, the last three and a half years, he calls it the Great Tribulation. He does so by quoting from Daniel 12, where it's alluded to, he quotes that, pins it from, the, from when you see abomination of desolation, then shall be the Great Tribulation. What makes it distinctive from other forms of tribulation as you learn more about it, you'll discover that God's wrath is being poured out. This is a tribulation not from Satan or the world. It's, it's upon the world and then ultimately upon Satan's, Satan's realm. So it's just the opposite. That's why it's distinctively different. And one of the promises to the church is that it will be removed before that happens. Another label of that same period in the Old Testament Je in Jeremiah 30 is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's worldwide, but its focus is on the Jews. The first Holocaust... In Germany, took one Jew out of three. According to Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9, the next one will take two out of three. Time of Jacob's trouble. Time, a time of trouble that they had never seen till that time or ever would see again. You see around in Israel, you'll never again. I got bad news for them. It will happen once again and worse. Of course, this whole thing then is the occasion of the second coming and the establishment of the millennium. So the 70th week is concluded, it, it, uh, it started by the, the establishment and the enforcement of this covenant. It concludes with the second coming of Christ and the, and the establishment of his kingdom upon the earth for a thousand years. Eternity starts after that. The Great Tribulation is defined by Jesus in quote from Daniel 12. He says, For then there shall be great tribulation such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. The, the Jewish label for this, the Old Testament label, is the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Daniel 12. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Michael's always a military commander on behalf of Israel, every time you see him. Gabriel's always a messenger on behalf of the Messiah. It's a different issue. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even at that same time. That's the quote that Jesus, in effect, echoes. And at, at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So at the end, they're going to be driven to the wall and then say a lot of the Old Testament <coughs> amplifies that in Hosea and elsewhere. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, the, it's interesting, the last few verses of Matthew 23 describe the purpose of all history. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings. And that's the purpose of all history. God's desire to gather his own. But the tragedy of all history is that he would not. The Messiah came as promised. In fact, on the very day he was scheduled, with hundreds of details fulfilling them to, to authenticate himself, and they would not have him rule over them. We have no king but Caesar, they cried. So as a result, the great tragedy says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate forever. No. Paul in Romans 11.25 says there, there, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, then God is going to once again be dealing with Israel. For I say unto you that ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, the triumph of all history. And that day, that will be the climax of the tribulation. The purpose of the tribulation is to drive them to the wall to recognize who their Messiah is. And when they do, he comes and rescues them. In Hosea 5.15, Jesus, or God says, in, through Hosea, he says, I will go and return to my place. How can God return? He must have left it. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. And indeed they will. That's the, the purpose of the tribulation is to get Israel to acknowledge their sin of rejection of the Messiah. It's going to take the tribulation to make them do that as a nation. That doesn't mean individuals aren't saved in the meantime, but as a nation, as a corporate commitment. That is yet future. And that all happens at Petra and so forth, and you can go look at it. Now, another issue you need to understand, you know, most people who have trouble in this area have problems not of eschatology, study of last things. They have problems in ecclesiology and also hermeneutics, hermeneutics being a theories of interpretation. And I'll come back to that last to show you. You can, you can tell where you are on a hermeneutical scale by your eschatology. Your eschatology will derive from your theories of, of, of uh, interpretation. But one of the other problems that most Christians have is they haven't done their homework on what's called ecclesiology, the study of the church. How is the church distinctive? Well, one thing, it's called the body of Christ. That's a very unique term. The New Testament portrays the church as the bride of Christ. We find that in Ephesians 5, very eloquently. There's 10 verses there, for, or 11 verses from... 22 on that detail that. I encourage you to just study that. It speaks for itself. You think, as he starts, that he's talking about husbands and wives. But as he gets to a climax, he then throws a curve on you. He says, I speak of Christ in the church. He's, he throws an ellipsis there. He wants husbands and wives to behave like, like the church should to Christ. But on the, then he turns it around. It also gives us a clue about the, idiom, the idioms that he's using all the, through the scripture. Romans 7, 4, 2 Corinthians 11, James, so forth. Now, Paul, in that passage, even quotes Genesis 2.24 as a union at the Perusia, or the, the appearance of the bridegroom. Genesis 2.24 is that famous passage, it's quoted several times throughout the scripture. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife, the two shall be one flesh. It comes out of Genesis 2.24, but of course it's used by Paul in Ephesians 5 to, to climax the marital union. But then next verse, he throws your curve. Verse 31, he mentions that, and then verse 32, he says, I speak of Christ in the, ch Christ in the church. So he's using that, the idiom of the, bride, the body of Christ and as the bride of Christ um, rather intensely. Now, the church is expressly exempted from God's wrath. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, we are not appointed to wrath, Paul tells us. And he says it emphatically in that passage. And also Revelation 3, 10, there is a church idiomatically a subset of the church that uh, is exempted from 
God's wrath. I'll keep you, not from the tribulation, from the time of the tribulation. Re Revelation 3.10, commonly expressed verses. There's another thing you should be sensitive to. When you read Daniel 7, you find a passage about the Antichrist. It says, I beheld the same horn that you know, made war with the saints and prevailed against them. When you see that, you should be shocked because you may remember Matthew 16. We'll look at that in a minute. When you look at uh, Revelation 13, 7, again, we're here speaking of the Antichrist, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Really? And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That's disturbing because we, see, here's the, in, in Daniel he prevails against them. In Revelation 13, 7, he overcomes them. In Matthew 16 at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus made an announcement. It's the first time that he announces the church. He says, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now it's interesting, the gates of hell, are gates offensive or defensive elements? Defensive. It's not the church that's defending itself against Satan, it's Satan defending himself against the church. Who has the initiative here? The church. The church. Let's not forget that. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, this word prevail and overcome is disturbing because it is, it is in the one case, we have the church will not be prevailed over. In the other case, the, the Antichrist will prevail over them. That leads to an, an insight that we, we, whenever you have a, a contradiction or apparent contradiction, study it carefully because behind that lies a discovery. And uh, I want you to think carefully. We're going to quote from both Matthew and Luke. Let's use Matthew because it's the closest. Um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. That's pretty wild. That's quite a statement. But then before the verse finishes, he goes on, he says, Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What on earth is going on here? Is he saying that John the Baptist wasn't saved? I don't think so. But the kingdom, when he's using the kingdom of heaven here, he's referring to something very specific. In fact, when we get to a few verses later in, Reve in verse 13 of Matthew 11, he says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. What he is saying, and what he says more clearly in Luke 16, 16, he says, the law and the prophets were until John. John the Baptist is the close of the Old Testament. We think of the Old Testament finishing at the book of Malachi. That's the last book in the Old Testament. There are 400 years of history still to come, and those are not the silent years. As everybody calls them silent years. No, they're dictated for you in detail in Daniel 11 in advance. The wars between the Ptolemies and the Seleucid empires for, the, for half a dozen dynasties um, are detailed there so precisely the critics have had to say, gee, Daniel, that must have been written later. It couldn't have been written back then. Well, it was. In the second, in the second of six dynasties and under Ptolemy Philadelphia is when the Septuagint translated all that stuff into Greek. It was around. It lays out history in advance with incredible precision. But the point is the, the Old Testament dispensation, the Old Testament period, closes with John the Baptist. John the Baptist is saved, but he's, he's saved under the Old Testament ground rules. See, we're, we're, and Jesus is introducing something new. Something new. We need to understand that not all saints are alike. Not all, that's the only point I'm trying to make here. There are Old Testament saints. There are people saved in the Old Testament. Make your list. You can guess who they are. There's the church, by definition. I'm not talking about churches and structures. I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about the true, biblical, believing church. church using the church as the Bible would use the term, the ecclesia. There are also people that will be saved after the church is gone. We're call, they're called tribulation saints. People who die during the tribulation are seen under the, you know, under the altar in the fifth seal, with the books open and so on. Um, we could talk a lot about this, but the point is, to anybody, if anybody that thinks the church goes through the tribulation has two pieces of homework to do. You've got to find out what the church really is. And as you do, you'll discover it's exempt from that for a lot of reasons. The second piece of homework, you've got to find out what the tribulation is really all about. What's its purpose? What's its goal? What's it, what's it out to do? And you'll discover they're mutually exclusive for lots of reasons. But that's a piece of homework. That's why, that's why this area of study is so challenging because you can't hang a doctrine on a single verse here and there. What you need to do is, your test is the whole counsel of God. 
and, and when you have a, a conjecture of some kind, does it fit the tests of tying all the loose ends together? It's the integration of the whole. And when you study eschatology, you can't divorce it from ecclesiology, you study the church. And all of that is driven by your hermeneutics, your, your theory of interpretation, and how it goes. Now, I might mention something else, by the way, so there's a lot of misunderstandings. Jesus had to leave physically for the Holy Spirit to be given to the church, but in a very special sense. The Holy Spirit's always been around, will always be around even after the church is gone, but not in the sense that it, he indwells the believer. The whole concept, that you, and, and I can, just a, briefing, like, a quick briefing like this, I can't build the whole case for you, just want to alert you to the possibility and have you study it yourself. The Holy Spirit was given in a unique way to the church, to indwell and seal you to your day of redemption. And that's something that would, that blew Paul's mind. He knew the Old Testament. He knew that David could pray, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You and I can't pray that prayer. We may sing that song, but we can't pray that prayer because the Holy Spirit's given without repentance, the scripture tells us. You need to study 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 and so on. Holy Spirit, and, and when he's removed in that special relationship, the church is removed, he's still God and he's still omnipresent. And he'll be very busy. People who are saved, there may be more people saved during the tribulation period than before. And any that are saved are saved by the Holy Spirit. You need to understand that. Now, there are Old Testament patterns. There's another kind of, this is not something you build doctrines on. It's one that you sort of uh, 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 use as collateral information to get perspective. I have a couple of favorites. There's a lot of these. I, I, I thought I'd just throw out through. Enoch and the flood of Noah. We'll talk about him in a minute. We're talking about Isaac's absence after his offering. It's interesting, when Isaac was offered by Abraham, he's edited out of the record until he's united with his bride, two chapters later. Very interesting. That's an alteration of the text in a very profound way in the Genesis 22, 19. Most of you who know my materials are familiar with that. Where was Ruth during the thrashing floor scene at the feet of Boaz? So you can study the, that whole typological thing. And uh, Where's Daniel in Daniel chapter 5? We have the fiery furnace. Where was Daniel? He's not there. So to the extent those are types, they point to a pre-trib typology. But let me just pick one and get into detail. I won't go into detail all those. There are three groups facing the flood of Noah. Three groups. Those that perished in the flood, right? There were those that pre were preserved through the flood. Only eight out of the entire world. That world might have been over a billion people. There are all kinds of calculations that people have made. It's not just a few tribes. It was very substantial. Out of the entire world, only eight were saved. The rest were wiped out. You want to understand why, there's a whole story behind it. But the main point is there's those that perished, there were those that preserved, and there were those that were removed prior. How interesting it is. And obviously the one that was removed prior was Enoch. You say, well, that was only one guy. Indeed, but the, so is the rapture only one person. It's the body of Christ. It's treated as a, a single body. Enoch was born, by the way, on the day that they, the Jews observed, for other reasons, as Hag Shavot. And uh, it's interesting, they have a tradition, I don't know where it comes from, I'm trying to track that down. They have a tradition that he was translated, raptured if you will, on Hag Shavot also. He's raptured on his birthday. I think, if I can prove that somehow from scripture, I would be very interested in that. Because he may be a type of the church. The church was born on Hag Shavot, Feast of Pentecost. Is it possible the church also will be translated or raptured on its birthday? You know, everybody, every year, people who study the Feast of Moses prophetically, you know, like to hang their hat on either a Feast of Trumpets or some a Feast of uh, Tabernacles, whatever. Uh, I'm not sure. It's, that's, I think it's sort of a, almost a date-setting kind of thing, so I wouldn't go too far with that. But if it's going to be, one, if he, if it's going to be on one of the feast days, I, my, my candidate would be the Feast of Pentecost. I think it's only half fulfilled. There may be another half coming. Hakshavot, Feast of Weeks, Harvest, Pentecost, whatever. Okay. Now something else that I want to share with you. This is not doctrine. And uh, you, will find, you won't find this in most of the uh, conservative uh, theological treatments of eschatology. You can, I'm, I, Hal Lindsay usually kids me a lot. He calls me a mystic and I guess I'm guilty. Um, but uh, I want to just show you some verses and you draw your own conclusions as to what they say to you. Okay, let's first of all start with Isaiah 26. Interesting passage. Now, Isaiah 26, starting about verse 19. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. 
Isaiah says, Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out their slain. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. Not his chambers, your chambers. Come, my people, enter thou in thy chambers. Shut thy doors about thee and hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past, is overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. I don't know what that's, what's that talking about. All I know is it says, Gee, come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. I wonder what chambers these are that can provide that kind of protection. Shut thy doors about thee and hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment. Until what's past? Until the indignation is overpassed. Wow, I think that's kind of interesting. Because the, the Lord is going to come out of the place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And that's the indignation. Until that's over, you've got your rooms now. Stay there and keep the door shut. That's in the Old Testament. Kind of interesting. Let's take a look at Zephaniah 2.3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. That's an interesting promise. That's an interesting promise. Psalm 27.5 For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me upon a rock. Who is that rock? Christ, Christ you got it. That's the, that's the easy part. Well, okay, we, we've, we've looked at a few pattern kinds of things. Let's hit ahead on some of the problems we encounter when we talk about these kinds of things. The root one you're going to, we want to talk about just briefly is amillennialism, because it is the commonly taught doctrine of the denominational churches, both Catholic and Protestant. And a subset of the other collection of problems, there's several of them, really beg the question, will the church or will it not enter the tribulation? And uh, let's take a look at this. Well, first of all, let's understand the right the return of Christ to rule, his right to rule. There are 1,845 references in the Old Testament. 17 books give prominence to the event. 318 references in the New Testament. 216 chapters. And 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament give prominence to the event of Christ coming back to rule on the planet Earth. Not rule in our hearts and all that. Rule on the Earth. Rule from the throne of David. That was Gabriel's promise to Mary, Luke 1.32. David's throne didn't exist in those days. For every prophecy of Christ's first coming, there are eight of his second coming. It's a well-documented event, well-documented in advance. Well, where on earth did we get this idea that he's not really going to come and rule? Well, it really goes back to Oregon. He was a writer that did many good things, but he also had a theory of that Scripture is mostly allegory. And the danger here is when you have an allegory, you can make it almost mean anything you want it to mean. And uh, Augustine picked up on this. He really, heavily influenced by Oregon, he developed, an, he did a number of wonderful writings nailing some of the heresies of his day. There's a long list of these. But what he also did, he really embraced this idea of amillennialism. The Bishop of Hippo, he did a lot, he's very influential. You have to sort of understand the politics of that day. The Roman Empire had not only legalized Christianity, by then, after Constantine, to the second guy after him, uh, made it the state religion. So pastors were government employees. Now you're in a government pulpit and you're going to start preaching how Jesus is going to come back to rid the world of its evil rulers? <laughs> it doesn't have any market research behind that, does it? It's a little, it's not, it's not exactly politically correct. Well, how they deal with all these passages? Well, speaking of allegory, Christ is going to come back and rule in people's hearts. And so they start finding ways to get around this. The idea of a literal millennium? No, no, no. It's a, they, they found by allegorizing, they got around this. The problem is that Augustine's writings, which embraced this, gave them the rationale, starts getting codified in the medieval church and becomes the core doctrine, not just the Catholic church, but the Protestant churches also. Roman Catholic eschatology is based on Augustine. And the Reformation did wonderful things in the area of soteriology, salvation by faith. Marvelous. People willingly were burned at the stake for their commitment to salvation by faith alone. 
So you can't knock that. But you do have to, as you stand back and write the report card, you need to realize they didn't go far enough to re-examine their eschatology. So they just went with what they'd also already been taught, the, what the, the, the Augustan amillennialism. So most Protestant denominations today that derive from the Re Reformation are amillennial on the one hand and also post-tribulational in their eschatological views. That is, they don't really believe in a literal return on the earth, to rule on the earth, and they also feel that the church somehow is going to go through the tribulation. It turns out those two ideas, strangely enough, go together. There are problems with amillennialism. There are messianic promises throughout the Old Testament that are unconditional, and if you don't believe God's going to fulfill those, literally you're calling him a liar. They're that clear, that specific, that authenticated. And what's the destiny of Israel in God's covenants? And that's a New Testament issue. Paul, in, in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine called the Book of Romans, hammers away chapters 9, 10, and 11. But God is not finished with Israel, yet they have a destiny prophetically. You need to understand that. Remember the promise given to Mary by Angel Gabriel that his, her child would rule on the throne of David. The throne of David didn't exist. That's a political throne that did not exist in those days. And of course there's numerous confirmations of these things all through the New Testament. Now another issue that really is integral to all of these issues, if you go to any pastor's study and look at his, you'll probably find a set of books he had in seminary called Systematic Theology. There's different ones around that are standards for different groups. But what's interesting, if you look at the table of contents of any one of those, you'll find a table of contents, something similar to this, the divisions of theology. Bibliology, the study of the Bible. Theology proper, the attributes of God. Christology, the study of Lord Jesus Christ. Pneumatology, they call it, the study of the Holy Spirit. Angeology, studies of angels, both fallen and unfallen. Anthropology, which what they what mean by that is the study of man in the Scripture. Study of soteriology, salvation. That was the big cause celeb during the Reformation, of course. Ecclesiology, the study of the church. And that's a weakness for many of us because we may not have really done our homework there. We probably don't understand most of Paul's epistles because he's dealing with problems we didn't, we, you know, he, he's giving solutions to problems we didn't know we had. And of course, eschatology, end time, last things. Now, what's interesting about this list, if you look at almost any set of so-called systematic theology that pro commonly taught in seminaries today, you'll see this list and you'll discover by examining it, they overlook a subject that involves five-sixths of the Bible. There's a subject not listed here that is one of the main subjects of the Bible, and that's the study of Israel, Israelology. Israel as an instrument of God's program. It's not a separated focus. It's astonishing when you realize that. No wonder there is some confusion on the horizon. Israel and the church. Many people have been taught that the church inherits the promises that were given to Israel. That means they don't understand either one because they have different origins, different missions, different destinies, totally different destinies. And uh, they, were, they, they call this replacement theology. The church has replaced Israel. Uh, I kidded Hal Lindsey once. I, went and do study. I said, Hal, i got to admit to you, I've become a replacement theologian. He looked at me shocked. He thought, you know, I've been tutored better than I. He looked at me and says, yeah, I says, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Israel's going to replace the church. And, and God's plan after the rapture, he laughed. He realized what I was doing. I was just inverting the thing. But anyway, um, replacement views deny Israel its place in God's program. It makes God a liar, and it lays the basis for Christian anti-Semitism. Augustine, you go from Augustine to Auschwitz. You follow the thread. And the tragedy is it's happening again. There's an anti-Semitism rising in the Christian church that will lead to the next Holocaust. You'd think we'd learn. Hegel, Hegel said it well. History teaches us that man learns nothing from history. We're going, we're going to go down the same path again. The 70-week prophecy, here's another issue, the reason I emphasize it, the 70-week prophecy that we looked at deals specifically with Israel, not with the church. They're mutually exclusive. The more you study it, the more you'll realize that. See, Paul's dichotomy, you know, if you look through Paul's epistles, he speaks of everything in th three parts. Jews, Gentiles, and the church. Three different groups. Those distinctives, you see, there is no Jew, he said, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, the church. In other words, there's either Jew or Gentile or you remember the church. That's the way he deals twice, several times in his, scripture, in his epistles. Those distinctives, again reappear after Revelation 4. 
One of the astonishing things as you study carefully the book of Revelation from chapter 4 on is to see the emphasis on the 12 tribes and Israel again and so forth. You won't understand the book of Revelation unless you understand its Jewishness. Well, let's take a look at eschatology. We've talked about amillennial. People don't believe there's a millennium. We are on the right end of that scale, premillennial. We believe there will be a literal millennium. There was a group for some years that were postmillennial. They said we're already in the millennium. This was a popular view up until about the First World War. With the war wars, I think that, that, the, the, that view as it was originally codified is pretty out of date. People, I think, realize we're not in the millennium. Or as one person said it, is if we're in the millennium, then Satan's chain is too long. So, But out of the premillennial thing, if you recognize there is a millennium, I'm assuming that you're biblically grounded enough to understand that, there are still three subsets of that that you get into discussions on. And that has to do with wh where does the church get raptured? Post-tribulational, mid-tribulational, pre-tribulational. Where am I getting, we're getting all this from. If we take a look at the 70th week, as we did before, the Great Tribulation, we know it gets uh, terminated by the second coming and the set setting up of the millennium. Where does the rapture of the church take place? The classical view of the church, or denominational churches, is what you call post-tribulation. That is, they believe that the church will get raptured at the end of the tribulation period. That would put it just ahead of the second coming. That view is widely held, has some serious problems. We'll look at a few of them. Among the problems, you know, as I think Kenny Poor once uh, wagged some years ago, he says, that makes the marriage supper of the Lamb a snack lunch. <laughs> you see? Because you go up, you're raptured, you have the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you come back down for the second coming. Uh, you know, it, it looks a little strange. If you say post-tribulational views, it turns out part of your difficulty is there's a large number of different views that they argue among themselves. There's no codified view that's post-tribulational. Payne and those guys could be labeled classical post-tribulationalism. Reese and those guys, semi-classic, slight differences. The futuristic post-tribulation is George Ladd and so forth. And uh, Robert Gundry, dispensational post-tribulation. All these are good guys, they're good scholars, and they love the Lord. That's what makes this area difficult because these are not, these are not evil people. These are not like you're fighting you know, some kind of deviant cult. At the same time, they have some problems I'll come back to that leave you some, some of the problems. First of all, each one of these has to deny the New Testament teaching of imminency. We are taught to expect him at any moment. If you're post-tribulation, you've got, you've got the whole 70th week of Daniel, you've got the abomination of desolation, you've got all this stuff that has to precede the, the rapture of the church. That's contrary to all the other teachings, see? It requires the church on the earth during the seventh week. That has all kinds of problems because Israel and church are mutually exclusive and there's a, that's a whole study in its own right. It also implies that the church experiences God's wrath. We were promised that we wouldn't experience it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Romans 3, and Revelation 3.10 and other passages similar to that. And the fundamental problem that bothers me, how can the bride come with him at the rapture? He's, she's got to be raptured first. There's a contradiction there. There are more problems. Who's going to populate the millennium? If the resurrection of the saints, the dead, the dead in Christ and the, and the living believers are raptured at the second coming and all the unbelievers are wiped out in their judgment, who is going to populate the millennium? Who's left? There isn't, you know, you gotta, it, it sounds funny at first, but it's, it's, a, it, there's, it, it's a real problem. And who are the sheep and goat judgment in Matthew 25? That's answering, asking the same thing in another way. How can the virgins of Matthew 25 buy oil without the mark of the beast? That authenticates this whole uh, Jewish wedding model I was saying about earlier. So the post-tribulational thing is the classical adversary to the pre-trib position. But there's, there are those that recognize the church will not go through the tribulation. And they correctly point out that the tribulation is the last half of the week. So they believe that the rapture takes place during the 70th week, but prior to the second half. Well, they be, can be commended in the sense of that insight, because we obviously agree with that, but at the same time, they also have the church on the earth during the 70th week, and that creates other problems. There is a variant of that view that's created some visibility called the pre-wrath position. The label's unfortunate, because all of us would argue that the 
pre-tribs, the mid-trib, and the pre we all argue that we're before the wrath, but they've used that as their title. But the, aside from other problems they have, first of all, they have the rapture taking place three-quarters of the way through the 70th week of Daniel. And so uh, all the rebuttals that apply to the mid-trip would apply to them too. It's tragic here in many respects because the people that we're talking about that are advocating some of these positions are uh, people that love the Lord. They're good scholars. Marv Rosenthal has a marvelous ministry. He's a, uh, uh, very, he's a uh, very, very uh, terrific uh, writer and leader in many ways. It's unfortunate that he's got hung up, in my opinion, in this deviant view, which has been pretty well, frankly, in my opinion at least, shredded by Stanton, um, showers and uh, most of the, the writers have done a, a specific uh, analysis of, of the position and it's got self-contradictions. The main problem without getting into all that here because I didn't want to spend our time hammering some of those things is they deny eminency. All these deny eminency and that I can rest my case there. The pre-trip position argues most people, you'll notice we do this a little differently, most people have the pre-trip at the beginning of the 70th week but that leads to an assumption that's not correct. The rapture does not trigger the 70th week of Daniel. It might, doesn't need to. It, may, it might be ahead of that by a little bit, and I'll show you why in a minute. But uh, uh, the pre-trip position is the only one that will, with which you can defend a doctrine of eminency, which is clearly taught all through the New Testament. The rapture precedes the tribulation of seven weeks. The, the 70th week is defined by the covenant of this coming world leader. The great tribulation is the last half of that 70th week. The leader cannot be revealed until after the rapture, and the leader has to be the guy that defines it. In other words, the sequence has to be the rapture, the revealing of the leader, the leader sets up the, the, the seven years, and then the last half of that seven years is the tribulation. So the church is removed, not just before the tribulation, but before the 70th week. In fact, the distance between the rapture and the 70th week has to be a distance that's, it could be one day, it might be 30 years. It's in that interval between the rapture and the beginning of the 70th week that leader has to emerge publicly, become strong enough to enforce that treaty. That could be a day, could be weeks, could be years, we don't know. Now 2 Thessalonians 2, if we were going to do a serious study of this, we would go through and carefully do an exegesis of 2 Thessalonians 2, but let me give you the summary of it. The Th 2 Thessalonians were really upset because they thought the tribulation had begun. Nero had started, the, the Romans now had started really laying on them. They were upset. They thought they either had missed the rapture or that, God, that uh, Paul had mistaught them. They had a letter going around that was a forgery of Paul's, and he writes 2 Thessalonians to, to rebut that forgery. And uh, so he talks about this, the 2 Thessalonian letter basically deals with, hey guys, remember what I taught you. And he's refreshing their memory to prove to them that they could, did not miss the rapture, that the tribulation hadn't started yet. They may be experiencing problems, but it's not the tribulation. He speaks of the day of the Lord. That's a term that's used connotatively and denotatively, two different ways, but for any case, it's certainly the big climax. For that day, the day of the Lord, shall not come except there be a falling away first. Most scholars feel that the word is apostasia. They feel that's a reference to the, a, a time of apostasy that has to come first. I'll come back to that because there's, there's another view, but I'll come back to that. He who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8 says, and then shall that wicked one be revealed. The sequence of events here is an apostasy, the restrainer removed, and we're going to argue that restrain, the restrainer has to be the Holy Spirit. From the Greek uh, uh, usage, plus the fact it's the, on, the only thing that has ever restrained sin is God. God the Holy Spirit, not, not angels. Not the, Roman, not the Roman government, not the church in the usual sense. When the restrainer is removed, which is the church and, and, and the Holy Spirit, then the man of sin will be revealed. The point is, this is one of those passages which indicate that the leader, the man of sin, will be after the rapture. It's a prerequisite. He, can't, he cannot be revealed until the Holy Spirit is taken out from the church. And then we get to the day of the Lord. So a careful study of 2 Thessalonians 2 will lay that out for you. Now, as I mentioned, eschatology has these, I won't go through all the, there are some other variants. There's preterisms on the rise. People say there's, there's no prophecy, it's always fulfilled past. That again requires enormous allegorization of scripture. There's the reconstructionists that say that uh, Israel's really the church, uh, his church is really Israel and all that. Uh, we're going to dismiss that. That's, 
not an issue. There, there are issues, but they're not just rapture issues. Most denominations are on the left side of this chart. They're amillennial and post-tribulational. At the right end of the chart, you have what people call fundamentalists. People take the Bible seri that seriously, literally, and so forth, and they would be premillennial, pre-tribulational. What's interesting is this will, where you sit on this chart will derive from your hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is your, is, is your, theory, of your theory of interpretation. If you're willing to allegorize scripture, say, well, it's just symbolic, you'll swing to the right side of the chart. If you have a different discipline, if you feel that the Bible means what it says and says what it means, if you feel that, uh, if, you, if you tend towards literalism, you'd be to the right side of the chart. Now, I've been that way most of my life, but I have to admit several times throughout my 50 years of study, I have many times come across something where I've had to revise my view. But what's interesting, every place that that's happened in my life, there been a number of them. It's always that I didn't take it literally enough. When I read Matthew 5, 17, 18, not one yacht or one tittle shall pass in the law till all be fulfilled. That drives me to literalism. And as I begin to study more and more and I see how the pieces fit together, I realize they fit even more clearly together the more literally you take the passages. I'm not talking about figures of speech now. That's a whole other study. So, now they, some people say pre-trib is a new position. That's not true. You'll find the, as pre-tribulation eschatology in the Epistle of Barnabas in the first century, Irenaeus against heresies, Hippolytus, these in the second century, Justin Martyr, Ephraim the Syrian. This is an interesting discovery that was just made a couple years ago. Now, Ephraim of Nisibus was a major writer for the Eastern Church, not the, West, not the Latin Church, the Eastern Church. Many, many of it. He wrote many of the hymns, many, many of his sermons have never been translated. And uh, this was discovered by uh, Grant Jeffries and Tommy Ice and, and uh, Tim Demme, and they uh, contracted to have it translated and confirmed. In one of his sermons, this is about the this is the 306 to 373. Uh, in, in his sermon on the last times, of the Antichrist and the end of the world, Ephraim said, "For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins." One of the phrases from his, his sermon. The point being only this: not that he's right or wrong. It's just that this this view was not is not new. It's the view of the early church. It was it was the view of the. Uh, New Testament church is the view of the early churches. And furthermore, you can track a remnant of this kind of teaching all the way through church history. I won't take you through all this list. Uh, it was popularized and, uh, by uh, Edward Irving, John Darby, Margaret MacDonald in the, in the in, uh, you know, early eight, uh, 19th century. But they didn't invent it. They just popularized it. Something else I want to put before you before we close. The architecture of the book of Revelation, there's many, many things I could pick. I'll just pick a few. There are lampstands in, that show up that are prominent in chapter 1. They are identified in the last verse of chapter 1 as identifying the church. Chapters 2 and 3 are the latter seven churches. I'll come back to that. From chapter 4 on, you don't find the lampstands on the earth. You find them in heaven when John gets there in the fifth verse of chapter 4. The lampstands are defended by the church. They're in the, they are in heaven in chapter 4. The, I hold that the rapture, that John is modeling, if you will, the rapture when he's called up there and treated to a, pre a preview of everything that's coming. Let's go to the 24 elders. A lot of confusion about this shouldn't be. The 24 elders are very prominent and they identify who they are. They are, identify themselves as the redeemed in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Out of 50 manuscripts, one of them uses a third person. All the others use, uh, thou, thou hast redeemed us, first person singular, plural. Thou hast redeemed us from all, every na tribe, tongue, and nation. And one manuscript has, a, has a, a second person there, and some people try to build a case on that. The 24 elders identify themselves, and the point of it is the 24 elders representing the church, bear in mind, there's only one group of people that are priests and kings. Melchizedek was a king and a priest, Jesus is a king and a priest, and his redeemed are kings and priests. First Peter and so forth speaks of us as a kingdom of priests and so forth. These guys, the, the, the uh, priesthood was 24 courses that David organized. If you study 24, it occurs only once in the Bible, once when, when, when David sets up the 24 courses of the priests in the temple. Anyway, the 24 elders, they worship the Lamb before he receives the seven-sealed book. It's when, the, after they worship him, the tribulation begins when the seven-sealed book is open. So get the sequence here. The saints are in heaven. They worship the Lamb. He receives the scroll. He opens the scroll. That starts the tribulation. The church is in, in heaven before the 
And, of course, the 70, the, the, from chapter 6 on is the detailing of the 70th week of Daniel up until the climax of Revelation 19 where the bridegroom and the bride have their marriage supper and so forth. Now, uh, furthermore, if you're going to study the seven churches in Revelation, you'll discover there are seven churches that are representative churches. Why these seven? Because they profile the church's history. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I encourage you, of all the passages in Revelation that really be familiar with, is chapters 2 and 3. They're the only ones that relate to you and I. They happen to be in the particular order they're in, they happen to lay out the history of the church. The apostolic church, the persecuted church, the married church, the medieval church, the denominational church, missionary church, and the apostate church. Don't accept from this chart, just use this as stimulus to do your own homework. It's interesting that the first three, I'll call group A, are distinctive in their structure that the promises given to the overcomers are postscripted to the letters. The second group, group B I'll call it, have two distinctives. One is the promises are in the body of the letter, promises of the overcomer, That's, they're somehow different, but also they have each of the last four have explicit references to the second coming. In fact, one of them, Thyatira, is promised that they're going to go into the Great Tribulation. That itself is interesting because that implies the others won't. It's a distinctive that the Thyatira will go, read, read the letter. There's one of the four that was promised it would not go into the time of the Tribulation. A couple of the others are problematical. We'll let you study those. If Thyatira is the medieval church or the Catholic church, then Sardis must be the Protestant church, and it's the only one, it's one of the two letters that has nothing good said about it. That should give us a little pause. But what we should recognize, we studied seven, letters, seven churches, is that each one was surprised by the report card. Every one of the seven was surprised by the report. Those that thought they were doing well were not. Those that thought they weren't doing well were doing great. That should give us cause, a pause to really understand the seven letters. Well, we know from a lot of reasons that we're getting near the end of it all. If you want to know what time it is, you just look at Israel. That's God's timepiece. For lots of reasons, we can infer that the 70th week is getting set up to happen. We have, of course, the Battle of Armageddon. We have the temple being rebuilt as a condition of the abomination. We don't know what's going to be rebuilt because it could be built before the 70th week or during the first half. Who knows? All we do know is that we'll be standing by the middle of that seven-year period because, because uh, Jesus... Paul and John all make reference to it there at the end time. There's the big issue of the Magog invasion. The classic placement of it is at the part of the Armageddon scenario. Hal Lindsey and many other very you know, all competent scholars hold that view. There's a few of us that have a different view. Grant Jeffries and Chuck Smith and myself and some others believe for a number of technical reasons that the Magog invasion occurs prior to the 70th week. Now, who's right and wrong doesn't matter. They may prove to be, the others may be proved to be right. The main point is we all do agree on one thing. It happens after the rapture of the church. The Magog is one of those things that happens after the rapture of the church because of the doctrine of eminency and, and about four or five other things. But, so anyway, in any case, it's close because the Magog invasion is, you know, we now see that I've for many years pointed to Turkey being pro-West as a major, you know, indicator. It's the only one that wasn't in the picture. They've just gone, the Islamic party has just succeeded the elections. You can expect Turkey to swing to the east. Turkey is a major player. They're not ready to do that next month or whatever. There's still 16 agreements with the Israelis to trade bases and so forth. But as the t time ticks off, Turkey will be increasingly adverse to Israel. And the Magog invasion that Ezekiel talks about could be all in place, implying a nuclear exchange. There are 10 reasons that I think the church will go before the tribulation. First of all, the fact that we're promised to be from the hour of trial, Revelation 3.10. And the word ek there, out of, promise out of thing, is from which we get the word exit, by the way. They're not, we're not, the church is not the object of God's wrath in Revelation 6.16. Contrast that with 1 Thessalonians 5.9. There's also a verse in Luke 21, verse 36. Word admonish, watch ye therefore, and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things which shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. You escape, not endure the tribulation. How do you do that, by the way? That implies that there's a way to keep out of it, right? You, did you follow that? Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. How do you do that? You do that by being in his body that's raptured. Another verse in uh, Luke 21. When these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. He says, look up, not look out. You don't find any admonitions for the church to watch out for the Antichrist. Watch out. Watch, no, no. Look up. 
First thing before war is you call your ambassadors to home. 2 Corinthians 5.20 calls us the ambassadors of Christ. And before the war starts, he'll call his ambassadors home. It's Restrainers removed before the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians 2, we looked at that. The rapture takes place in the twinkling of an eye, not in, as an extended activity. That's another issue that you can sort through. It happens in the air, not on the earth. And the woman in Revelation 12 is uh, Israel, not the church. It's the body of the child that gets caught up. And, of course, the marriage supper in heaven, it includes the raptured, and it happens before Revelation 19, verse 11 to 14. By the way, I've selected these 10 out of 50 that are listed in John Walver's book, The Rapture Question. There's plenty of literature on the subject for those who want to do their homework. So let's wrap it up. Let's talk about the proposal. How will all this affect you is the question. Back in John 14, we said, the Lord said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Do we really? He said, Jesus, Jesus said, I, in a few verses later, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ, either was God or wasn't, either knew it or didn't know it. Right. If he wasn't God and didn't know it, he's a lunatic. They can dismiss that pretty easily. If he wasn't God and knew it, he's a liar. He certainly claimed to be the voice of the burning bush, etc. That means if he was God, he's our Lord. He was who exactly, who he said he was, and you can prove it from the scriptures. So let me talk about it a little before we wrap up. Let's wrap up. Let's talk about him. We've talked a lot about eschatology and things. Let's talk about him. He's the king of the Jews. He's literally going to take the throne of David in Israel, which means he's also a national king. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of all the ages, the king of heaven, the king of glory, and king of king and lord of lords. And the real question is, do you, do you know him? Do you really know him? He was a prophet before Moses, a priest after Melchizedek, a champion like Joshua, an offering in the place of Isaac, a king from the line of David, a wise counselor above Solomon, his beloved, rejected, and exalted son like Joseph, yet far more. The heavens declare his glory. The firmament shows his handiwork. He who is, who was, and will always be, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tau, the A and the Z. He was the first fruits of them that slept. <clears throat> He's the ego I me. The Ichyach, Asher Ichyach. Yes, he's the, he said, I am that I am. He's the voice of the burning bush. He was the captain of the Lord's host. He was the conqueror of Jericho. He's enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful, imperially powerful, impartially merciful. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the very God of very God. He's our kinsman redeemer, and he's also our avenger of blood, and he's also our city of refuge. He's a performing high priest, our personal prophet, our reigning king. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology, and he's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the miracle of all the ages, the superlative of everything good. You and I are the beneficiaries of a love letter. It was written in blood on a wooden cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. And by him are all things held together. And what held him to that cross? It wasn't the nails. At any time he could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. It was his love for you and me. Amazing love. He was born of a woman so that we could be born of God. He humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. He became a servant so that we could be made joint heirs with him. He suffered rejection so that we, be, could, be, <clears throat> that we could become his friends. He denied himself so that we could freely receive all things. And he gave himself so that he could bless us in every way. He's available to the tempted and tried. He blesses the young. He cleanses the lepers. He defends the feeble. He delivers the captives. He discharges the debtors. He forgives the sinners. He franchises the meek. He guards the besieged. He heals the sick. He provides strength to the weak. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He serves the unfortunate. He sympathizes and he saves. 
His offices are manifold. His reign is righteous. His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His light is matchless. His grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. His word is enough. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. <laughs> he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's irresistible. He's invincible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Man cannot explain him. Pharisees couldn't stand him, but soon learned they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault with him. The personal representative of the ruler of the world couldn't find fault with him. The witnesses couldn't agree against him. Herod couldn't kill him. The, gra the death couldn't handle him. The grave couldn't hold him. He has always been and always will be. He had no predecessor and he'll have no successor. You can't impeach him and he ain't going to resign. His name is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Wow is right. Hallelujah. What a prayer. Let's, uh, let's refresh our memory of John 14 and re-examine the promise he's given you. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Notice the yous. That's you, I hope. See, that is the real question that I'm hoping you will resolve in the privacy of your own will. Is he coming for you? It matters not what church you go to, what denomination you're affiliated with, how faithful you've attended Sunday school, whatever. That's not the issue. The issue is your personal relationship with him. Are you part of his bride that's waiting eminently for, your, for his return? It could be tonight, could be tomorrow, next week. We don't know. But he's coming for his own. Is he coming for you? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for our bridegroom. We thank you for our Savior that's gone to such extremes that we might live, that we might have fellowship and intimacy throughout eternity with you, Father. Not by any merit we have, but entirely because of the extremes he's gone to. We thank you, Father, for our Savior. We thank you for our redemption. We thank you, Father, for the assurances that you've given us of our calling. We thank you, Father, that we have the unspeakable privilege of being part of his body, part of the bride. We pray, Father, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, keep us separate, keep us focused, we do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit that you would reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new passion for your word, and that through your Holy Spirit that you would illuminate that path before us. Help each of us, Father, to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Help each of us, Father, to be more fruitful stewards of these incredible gifts and promises. Then in all these things, Father, we might be pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our blessed hope, as we look for his appearing. Amen.